Good morning, lovely people. Today, I'm going to tell you why IQ doesn't matter. Our emphasis on IQ is mostly based on a poor understanding of intelligence and how the brain works and what an IQ test is. I've always thought the claims made about IQ were pretty spurious, but I'm surprised to see that we're still talking about it as much as ever. And I think I know why. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. I'm not going to go too deep into the history of IQ and IQ testing, because you can read books and watch other videos on it, but we should probably start with some basic history. About a hundred years ago, Alfred Binet started the IQ test at the request of the French government. He designed the test to predict which kids would do well in schools, so that at least you could give assistance to those who probably wouldn't do so well. Binet himself argued IQ tests were a poor measure of intelligence. And he was right. We think of IQ as being synonymous with intelligence, but it isn't. IQ is merely another score on a test. Do you really think all the test scores you've ever received were a perfect reflection of your abilities in that subject? What if they asked stuff you hadn't learned? How could it be about your intelligence as opposed to knowledge? An IQ test measures a couple of types of intelligence, mostly visual spatial abilities, math, and language skill. Are those our only abilities? The only abilities that matter? Oh, the only abilities that indicate intelligence? No, no, and no. The idea of intelligence is hotly debated among psychologists, but it should be clear that writing a test is not the end of the debate. For example, if you were really tired when you wrote the test, you'll get a much lower score. So you're not as smart as others for the rest of your life because you were tired that day. What if you'd been bullied or abused recently? Are you going to get the same mark? No. So why do we put so much emphasis on testing? Do we live in some sci-fi dystopia where everyone's sorted into career tracks based on their performance on paper? No. Testing for IQ is not necessary. It doesn't indicate the reasons for getting a low or a high mark. Parents and teachers can identify those kids who need help and should probably help them with regard to their specific problems, not where they rank in IQ ratings. And in fact, that's what they do anywhere they're not forced to act according to stringent rules because they care. Your performance on IQ tests, however, depends on a lot of factors outside your brain like how much uncertainty you're living with. Imagine you don't know where your next meal is coming from, or you think your landlord is about to kick you out, or you're afraid you're going to get beaten up by bullies or your parents or teachers or the police. How are you supposed to perform under those conditions? On the other hand, give an IQ test to a child who's well cared for, well fed, goes to the best schools or can afford the best tutors, you're likely to get a higher result. It's not for sure that the relatively advantaged kids will always outdo the less advantaged on tests because we're individuals. We can only talk very generally about this kind of thing. No one could reasonably expect the one of the millions of kids who get no education of any kind, who can't read because they had to help their parents all day on a farm or work in a factory or in a mine to get anything on an IQ test. However, any of those kids could be or could have been geniuses by our standards under the right conditions. They should be healthy right from the womb. They need happy, safe conditions at home growing up. They should get a variety of opportunities to stimulate their brains. And by the way, that's not the same as doing schoolwork. The point is, test results do not reflect intelligence, and intelligence is not fixed. It's conditioned by a million factors, not all of them in your DNA. Intelligence is partly inherited, 
partly, but we don't know how much of an individual's intelligence comes from their parents or even from teachers, communities, friends, media, etc. So all we know is there's some correlation between the IQ of parents and their children. There's also a correlation between the parents' income and children's IQ, which shouldn't be too surprising. Elderly people score lower on IQ tests because of the effects of aging, but then so do people with myopia or short-sightedness, and psychologists don't even really know why. More questions are raised by the Flynn effect. Researcher James Flynn found IQ scores have risen consistently ever since they've been measured. Our great-grandparents, by today's standards, would have average IQs of about 70. So what would those tests that they took have told us? We know they're not accurate. There are too many variables in an individual's life, including major social changes, that affect how smart they are by whatever measure. Science, especially social science, as I touched on two videos ago, has often been used in the service of the dominant powers and ideas of the time. Even when the powerful don't find a new idea particularly useful, there's still the chance it'll pick up steam among the rest of us. It's tough to question everything all the time, so we come to accept things as scientific fact when they might be totally baseless. Sometimes we learn a bit about concepts that in science are much more complex than we realize, but they're handed to us as finished articles. Intelligence is one of those things. We don't all mean the same thing by intelligent or smart. I don't even really use those words because they're so imprecise. The way we use it is like most of the words we use, defined by the culture not by some scientifically derived objective certainties. Psychology is not the same kind of science as, say, physics. It's much harder to test and draw firm conclusions. There's no consensus among psychologists on the definition of intelligence, let alone how to measure it. I found with most concepts in social science, you can observe them from, for yourself, maybe with a little help from theory. What I talk about in these videos, totally you can observe for yourself and compare what I say to the real world. You can do the same thing with, with most concepts in psychology, because it's about the brain and you have a brain. You know, just let's not assume everything we observe is universal and objective reality. And let's make allowances for our cognitive biases. You can learn about your cognitive biases and about how memory works and how observation works and how to do better on an IQ test, too. But that's not how IQ is used. It's used to limit people. IQ tests do not measure everything psychologists consider intelligence. Where's the test for creativity? Why is that less important? Well. It isn't less important. We just don't question the claim that IQ tests measure intelligence. Well, do they measure our ability to plan and strategize? No. So those things aren't important? Or they're not considered intelligence? Says who? Actually, psychologists have come up with various types of intelligence. Creative and strategic thinking could be considered types of intelligence, and they're extremely useful. Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences is pretty interesting. Not the final word on things, but uh, certainly seems to make sense. The different types of intelligence he identifies um, include things that are not measured on the IQ test. Like, uh, sorry, sorry, it includes... Things that are measured, like the logical mathematical skills, but it's much less limited that way. Although, you know, in my opinion, anytime you measure and classify things, you're limiting them. Like taking a frog out of the pond and sticking it in a jar. But along with the logical mathematical and like visual spatial, 
types of intelligence, there's things like emotional intelligence, self-awareness, and even being in touch with nature, which you can believe is a form of intelligence or not, but the, the term refers to a convergence of brain functions working to make sense of some aspects of the world. Is that not what intelligence is? Language proficiency, another intelligence, isn't one thing at all. It depends on long and short-term memory, processing input, responding, learning and then following a million grammar rules, accumulating vocabulary, deploying it eloquently, and so on. So there's language skills, and there's interpersonal intelligence, which again is lots of different things, as you can, you can imagine, and there's the relationship between the linguistic and interpersonal intelligences. Because we can call them separate intelligences, but how separate are they really? I have to be able to write, uh, to relate to you if I can write a book or a stand-up routine. They're overlapping categories. See how complicated these things are? It's hard to talk about intelligence without making assumptions. Remember, our language can be quite simplistic. What we call skills and intelligence and talent and so on are the use of various parts of our brain working in concert. Even during the most basic functions, like listening to this sentence, trillions of things are going on in your brain. You've got 86 billion neurons, and contrary to popular belief, you use them all. You think you can measure that activity accurately? You really think if you take a test on paper for criteria chosen long before we understood the brain like we do now, that tests for something different from what we say it tests for, then assign a number to the result and say that's your overall intelligence relative to other people. You really think that would reflect reality? measure the complexity of our brains without limiting them, revealing some kind of important, useful fact? Can we use the results for something other than to rank and classify people and then retroactively justify those classifications? There are other kinds of intelligence that reflect clusters of functions, like musical ability, if you still think of those things as skills as distinct from intelligence, then you're probably still falling into the trap of thinking intelligence is this narrow, specific thing measured by IQ tests. And it isn't. There seems to be a correlation between testing well on IQ or other intelligence tests and what's known as G, or general intelligence which implies that if you're good at one type of intelligence, you're more likely to be good at other types. But there's no consensus on G. And even assuming it's accurate, it doesn't really matter. No one is a genius in all the ways you can be. And everyone who isn't too disabled has talents and skills and the ability to improve them. If you hone your skills, whatever your skills, you can be a genius. If you were informed by an authoritative test when you were young that you're not smart, you might not try to hone your skills or, or just give up more easily. That said, even if you don't take an IQ test, school will beat the spirit out of most kids one way or another. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please see my whole playlist on education, which of course I link to in the description. If you really need to test a skill, go ahead. Just don't test three skills and say that is now how smart you are. In the age of science, we feel like we, we have to measure everything by these supposedly scientific measurements. But why do we have to measure intelligence? It's poorly defined and even more poorly understood. Why do we rank children according to their intelligence, or for that matter, according to any of the tests we make them take? To inflate some heads and doom others to failure? 
people carry the the nonsense that they learned at school with them their entire lives until they unlearn it? Why do we classify kids by vague, unnecessary, misleading labels? It's like we're trying to limit them. Our brains are, are really adaptable. Why don't we teach kids that? The truth about intelligence. That we're so adaptable. That our brains change every time we learn something. See? Yours just changed right there. It's called plasticity. You might also want to teach your kids how to be wise, since wisdom is astronomically more important than intelligence. And also tell them you need to do lots of learning to get there. So why is the idea of IQ still alive? Short answer, racism. Quite soon after its invention, the IQ test was picked up by racists and used for their purposes. That shouldn't be too surprising. Racist pseudoscience has existed in some form for hundreds of years now. I don't know if you can even talk about IQ without discussing its racist history. Just like you can't really talk about racism as if it were an individual phenomenon with no history behind it. IQ was used to claim black and Latino people in the US were less intelligent than whites. And IQ results were used to sterilize tens of thousands of people in the US, even into the 1950s, because they were labeled mentally inferior. As we can see from the popularity of the book The Bell Curve, it's still used to justify racism. It's easy to make things look scientific. Look at all these tests we did. Now we're going to extrapolate based on those tests and continue to speak confidently without recognizing our assumptions for what they are. Why, when extrapolating, did you choose to compare racial groups? Why was that important? There's no historical context for explaining IQ differences, so what's the point of averaging IQ across an arbitrary category like race and comparing results across racial groups? It could be used to provide yet another indicator of how poorly black or other people of color are treated if you included a lot more analysis in with the statistics, but they didn't. Because the same people who want to know the average IQ of an entire race are only interested in proving that race's inferiority. The words we use for races are historical and cultural, not biological. They don't correspond to anything in biology. Yet the assumptions behind the bell curve took self-identified racial categories as meaningful. Was that because maybe many of the studies cited in the bell curve were financed by the Pioneer Fund, an explicitly white supremacist eugenicist organization? Oh, you hadn't heard about that. Yeah, the author, Charles Murray, doesn't usually mention that. But when it's brought up, he does say his sources come from, quote, some of the most respected psychologists of our time. <laughs> Intelligence is not fixed, and your IQ pretty much changes with your mood hardly a solid basis for reaching any conclusions about a person, let alone a whole group. And yet, Charles Murray got famous for doing just that. It's amazing what we'll latch on to to prove our own superiority. I got a high result on an IQ test, so I'm smarter than you. Or, or even, uh, who cares what I got on my IQ test? I'm still smarter than you because I'm white. <laughs> Silly. These people simply don't want to know how genes actually work. They think that because someone looks different, they must belong to a group that is fundamentally different. Then, then, they build a body of science around that to try to prove it. <laughs> 
But that's not how truth works. That's how pseudoscience works. Scientific racism is not scientific, but just a way of justifying white supremacy. It's about power. It ignores what we know about biology and psychology. No complex human behavior is caused by one gene. No group differences can be shown to be strictly environmental or strictly genetic. When we start making assumptions about connections that aren't there, our commitment to rational inquiry goes out the window. So statistics on IQ are pretty much worthless. They don't tell us anything interesting about the group differences. So why would Sam Harris invite a quack like Charles Murray to be on his podcast? Was it to explore both sides of the controversy? Well, if it was, he failed, since he called a number of Murray's very dubious claims facts. These are facts, people. Yeah, right. There's a lot that Harris and Murray got wrong in their interview. Murray says intelligence is largely fixed and genetic and measurable by IQ tests and retroactively proves racial categories valid. And none of those things are very likely. Harris and Murray seem to think nothing could be done to raise intelligence or IQ scores when actually the research shows all kinds of things raise IQ scores. Different families, different neighborhoods, different friends, different schools, a teacher who actually takes the time out to help you or challenge you, more money, or even just a decent bed so you can sleep better. So far from being that a person, let alone an entire group that's been systematically discriminated against for centuries, can't improve their intelligence, it's actually quite clear the right circumstances would do just that. Better education, such as the ideal education I map out in my playlist on education, boosts intelligence and outcomes related to intelligence. Higher incomes at home, which, after all, mean less uncertainty and more ability to cope with crises, lead to higher test scores. These are things we could easily change by implementing better education or giving people more money. A lot of people assume we've been doing those things for 70 years or more, but we haven't. That's based on the myths we like to propagate about how, since the civil rights era, everyone is equal now. No one is poor, no one's discriminated against, and policies reflect that. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So people like Harris and Murray do zero historical analysis and just take their assumptions for granted and call them facts instead of looking at the many policies designed to keep people of color in poverty in the worst neighborhoods and keep them going to jail. If we're talking about IQ in such conditions, we're probably asking all the wrong questions. The real question is, how can we change those conditions that are holding us all back? I have other questions, too. Why would you want to talk about IQ differences among racial groups? Why would it matter? What would it reveal? Why would you want to talk so much about race as distinct from racism? Why are you imputing meaning to something that basically means nothing? Is it because your whiteness is all you've got? To wrap up, it's not that there's no such thing as intelligence, but it's really complicated. It's full of misconceptions. And someone else's intelligence shouldn't matter to you. And as I'll explain in my next video, we are all potential geniuses. Thanks.